have a reason to worship? All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. Oh, all of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare. God is my victory. You're here, Lord. Come on, let's just sing that bridge one more time together. I feel like we just need to declare that in this place. If you're going through something, that in every season, that we can still worship God. Come on, sing this with me. In all of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. All my life, all of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing. I have a reason to worship. Oh, yeah, we do, Lord.
Does anybody have like a struggle this week or something special happened this week? And you're like, I'm glad this week is done. Is anybody? A couple of you, you're like, I don't want to tell anybody. You know, it's not a weakness to, to admit you had, you know, you had a, a, tough, a tough go this week or it was a challenge. That's okay. Well, I know that uh, as we get into the word here in just a second, I, I, want to, I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you with uh, a reality check. I'm going to give that a second to sink in. I want to give you a reality check. And here it is. Life is not fair. I know you want it to be. I want it to be. But life is unfair. It will not give you everything you want. Even church will not give you everything that you want. The only thing that will, will bring true contentment in your life is, is giving your life away to Jesus. That is the only thing that will, will start to develop contentment, will start to develop satisfaction, will start to develop purpose in your life. Because life in and of itself is unfair. Life is unfair. I know that's not what you want to hear to start off, but don't worry, it's going to get better. But life is unfair. If we don't start with that reality, we're always offended. And offense is despicable. Why is offense so despicable? Because offense says that everybody owes you something. Our world is full of offense today, isn't it? If you say something somebody doesn't agree with, they're offended. You know how you stop offense? You don't care. It's really simple. You know, I don't, I don't care that you're offended. I didn't say something to you that offended you. You're offended that I love Jesus. 
You're offended that I have morals. You're offended that I go to church. You're offended that I take a stand. You're offended that I, I believe that, there, uh, that I am a sinner. You're, you're offended that I, I believe that this word is true and accurate and real and that I should adhere to it. If people are offended by the truth, the issue belongs to them. Now, if you go around being a little bit of a mean-spirited person, you know, you go around saying things, you know, just because you go around and, and, and you know, you don't have much of a filter up here, or maybe the filter should be right here, maybe that's why the world wants us to wear masks. Maybe there's not enough filters over the words that come out of our mouth. Not so much for the droplets as much as it is for the words. If you're going around offending people with your words just because you want to be offensive, then the issue lies with you. But truth be told, in life, it's unfair. Why is it evil people prosper and good people go hungry? Why is it some people get sick and die and and others get healed? Why is it some people are successful with almost no effort and others have to work really hard to get even a little bit? That's not fair. Why, Why is it the tree fell on the neighbor's house and not in yours in the storm. Why, why is it these things happen? Why is it they found love and I didn't? It's unfair. You know, we have a very childish view of fairness, don't we? You ever notice what children and un- un- fairness, you, know, you notice that? You ask a child, you know, they get into an argument with another child, and they say, that's not fair. I hear that word every day in my house. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. It's like, I don't care anymore if it's not fair. Do what you're told. But we have this childish view, even as adults, as, as, as fairness should be evenly spread. And in a perfect world, maybe that would happen. But truth be told, we don't live in a perfect world, do we? We live in a world that's got some flaws in it. You know what's great about this world and this life, though, we have a Savior who is unflawed. We have a Savior who is very fair, who doesn't show partiality. We have a Savior that can deal with the unfairness that we will experience in our life. So I'm going to leave you with the big, this big idea to start this off, talking about unfairness. One of the most difficult lessons to learn in life is this, that life itself is not always fair. This is a lesson that we need to learn here today. Why, why, why am I talking about unfairness? Because you're, you're not going to even appreciate the giftings and the blessings that God gives you if you're always worried about being fair. Why is it that person can speak in tongues and I can't? Why does that person heal and I can't? Why did that person get touched and I didn't? And it becomes an, a me versus them. Did you happen to ask yourself that maybe... You've got an issue of undealt with offense or sin in your life. And God doesn't bless disobedience. He blesses obedience. Yeah, but look at their life. Yeah, but you don't realize that three, four, five weeks, or three, four, five months ago, three, four, five years ago, they gave it all over to the Lord and they have repented of that and they have moved on and they've been seeking God each and every day. And now they're at a place where God can bless them regularly because their heart is right with me. They, have, they bear the scars and the consequences of those lifestyle choices in the past or of those decisions from the past, but they don't make those decisions anymore. They make godly decisions now and so God can bless them. But you, on the other hand, you gossip. You, on the other hand, you don't give. You, on the other hand, you hate your neighbor because... They have a loud car in their driveway. You have issues of unforgiveness, but you look really good in church. I say these things for for one reason, friends. It is time for church people to stop having sugary messages told to them. Because Jesus could come back today. Here's the question. Are you ready? See, I think a lot of us say we are. But then we get back into the unfairness issue and it hits us like a ton of bricks that something unfair has happened and why shouldn't I get what I deserve? Son, if you got what you deserved, you'd already be in the place of hell. 
If I got what I deserved, I'd already be occupying the realms of Hades. See, friends, we need to understand unfairness is a lie of the devil. It's demonic in nature because what it says is that your, what you want is more valuable and more important than what God is saying you should have, what God is saying you should do, or what somebody else should have or what God is doing in their life. It's an outwardly focus instead of an upwardly focus. Let's look at our text. 1 Peter chapter 3. It'll be on the screen. If you have your Bibles, open them up, turn them on. And don't be afraid to bring Bibles to church, by the way. I know there's not a whole lot of Bibles around here. Don't be afraid to bring your Bibles. Here we go. NIV, verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Who? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. I'll say that one again. But in your heart, revere. Some, some younger people may not know what revere means. Hold in awe. Hold in, in uh, amazement. Jesus as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Uh, I'll say that again. Always be prepared. We'll come back to this in a minute. But always be prepared. But do this with gentleness and respect. There's the offense issue right there. Verse 16. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better... Uh, if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteousness for the unrighteous, uh, and to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the Spirit. Oh, there is so much here. We could, we could take three or four weeks to go over this, but we, I think I can summarize it pretty good today uh, in one. We're going to go back a little bit. Verse 14, Even if you should suffer, for what is right, you are blessed. You know something? You say, I'm suffering. I don't like this. It's not fair. You know something? You are blessed when you suffer for what is right. Amen. When somebody says, I won't serve you in my, my restaurant, you Christian. Great. See you later. God bless you. Find another restaurant. Stop fighting with them. When you turn the other cheek, I do recall a savior of some name, particular name, saying something about turning the other cheek. Christians hate that, that passage. I think every human hates that passage. You know why? Because it's really hard to turn the cheek when it's burning red from a hand slap. Have you ever been slapped in the face? If you've ever been slapped in the face, you know that it, it's not a great feeling. Especially when it's not done because, you know, you're trying to wake yourself up. You know, you wake in the morning, you kind of give yourself, though not your own little love slaps. I'm talking about when somebody slaps you, and they're mean about it. It's a terrible feeling. It's like, like I, I, I've had that happen a few times, and, and, you know, it's like waving red in front of a bull. It doesn't matter how big the bull is, or how big the, the, the whatever it is, it just, it just, that's just a line crosser for me. But yet Jesus says, turn the other cheek. See, even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. See, we always think that blessings should happen now, but blessings may happen in eternity. They may happen a year from now. I, I've, I've in the past, remember being wronged for something, doing the right thing and being wronged, and months later, seeing the reward from being wronged back then for not reacting to the injustice to not reacting to the unfairness that was given to me. And so that's what he says. If you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Don't fear threats of other people. Don't be frightened by it. But in your heart, deep within who you are, the essence of what makes you you, in that deep spot right there, revere Jesus as Lord of your life, always being prepared to give an answer. So he says, why... Why are you saved? Why, why, do you, why are you a Christian? Be prepared. How do you get prepared? You prep ahead of time before it happens. 
So in, in, on the 22nd, we're going to have a baptismal service here. We're actually going to have two baptismal services, both services. We're going to have different people getting baptized. They're going to be asked, you know, why do you want to be baptized today? That is like a great opportunity that they need to be prepared for to give a reason. Why are you getting baptized? I don't know. Maybe you should be baptized today. So those of you that are here right now, think about what I'm saying. Hint, hint. Get ready. The cameras will be running. Freezing up will be not optional. But honestly, you've you got to prepare ahead of time. Why are, you, why are you a believer? I'm a believer because Jesus washed my sins away. Why am I saved today? Because God was merciful to me and he showed me a better way. Why, why do I have hope today? Because my Savior has promised me that there is an eternity where there will be no more tears any longer. I have a reason. I prepare myself in advance. All these years, I read through Scripture. I pray to the Lord. I work out those kinks in my life that shouldn't be there. Not on my strength, on His I'm prepared when somebody asks me, why are you a believer? You know, one of the things that really irritates me about pastors, here's a little pastor pet peeve of mine. I heard so many pastors say this, even recently in the last year. Oh, I, I get so embarrassed when somebody asks me what I do. If you're embarrassed uh, in the secular world that you're a pastor, you need to get out of the ministry right now and take a sabbatical. Ooh, the room goes quiet. I probably have some calls from local pastors this week. If you're embarrassed about why God has called you into this work, you have a problem. I am not embarrassed by it. I don't care when they give me silly comments back about, really? Yeah, that's what I do. You know, honestly, I get better responses from non-believers about the work I do than I do from Christians. Christians are like, oh, that's nice. That's nice. Non-Christians are like, oh, really? Then they start out, like, well, where, where, where's your church? And then they, it's amazing how it creates a whole conversation because I'm not trying to, to impress them. They ask what I do. It's like I ask them what they do. Where do you live? Where, where are you from? You know, you start a conversation. Don't be embarrassed about your salvation because Jesus says if you're embarrassed in front of men about me, then I'll be embarrassed about you in front of my Father. And if our leaders are embarrassed about the work they do for Jesus, there's no hope for us. I see a room full of leaders here because we are a priesthood of believers. If you, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, you are part of the priesthood of believers. You should not be embarrassed of the salvation that you claim for your own. You should be proud of it. And that's what he says here. So hold, revere Christ in your heart. And then he says, always be prepared. You've got to keep a clear conscience if we break down through the text here, he says, keep a clear conscience. It's pretty simple. How do you keep a clear conscience? Don't do bad things. Obedience. Remember the old song? And who's been a, been a, who remembers the old Sunday school song, Obedience Is? Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Anybody know that song? You remember that? Who, with a show of hands, who remembers that song? Oh boy, I'm going to have to teach you something. This is good. Sunday school days. Way back. Little guy. Curly hair. Not there now. Be that as it may. We would sing this song, and then we would, I learned how to spell the word obedience through the song. O-B-E-D-I-E-N-C-E. -E -E. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Scripture says obedience is better than sacrifice. Because sacrifice says something has to die to make up for the sin that you have committed. Obedience says no one had to die because you were, you were uh, righteous all along. Friends, let's practice obedience. Instead of making up for an affair that we committed in our life, how about you show a little restraint and don't have the affair? Instead of going around and being offensive and hurting people, I don't mean offensive for your faith, I thought about being rude with your words. Instead of going around being rude with your words, how about you show a little bit of grace the way God gave it to you and not hurt somebody in the, in the process? Wouldn't that be a better way? Wouldn't it be great if, if Christians were known as the way they used to be? People wanted to hire Christians because they knew that they weren't going to be stolen from. And now a lot of Christians don't show any difference from people who are non-Christians in the way they act. Your lifestyle should be holy. Not because the holiness saves you, but because your Savior deserves your allegiance and it will bless your heart, 
It'll bless your mind, it'll bless your body, it'll bless your relationships, it'll bless everything about you when you're obedient to Jesus. And you know what? When you're obedient because you love God, when you're obedient because you don't want to dishonor Him, you're, you're obedient with a smile. You're obedient with joy. You're obedient with gladness. It's no longer drudgery to be obedient. It's like, I can't help but not be obedient because God is so good. And those things pale in comparison to what God has given me here today. So, things to know when life seems unfair. Because life is going to be unfair. You know, Rocky said it really great in his movie, The World Ain't All Sunshine and Rainbows. Right? It's a very mean and nasty place. And it'll beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you'll let it. You, me, or nobody will hit as hard as life. But it's not how hard you're hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. It's about how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. That's what we are called to do. We are called to be winners. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're saying, I want to go to the winning team. I, I, I want to go away from the losing side. I want to go to the winning side. I want to go from falling down to the one who can run through the line. Why is that? Not because I have the strength, but because my Savior gives me the strength to do it. See, life hits hard. And the first thing you need to realize is this. When life seems unfair, the first thing you need to know is uh, Christians live by a different standard. You live by a different standard. Maybe you've been living by the old world standard. Because that's what you knew. Don't don't feel bad because you're still living by an old standard if you've come to Jesus and you, you didn't really know. This is why we talk about being prepared in our text today. Be prepared. I talk about lots. Learning how to, to live righteously. It's a taught behavior. It's, it's a, a habit-forming nature. And friends, we have to live by a different standard. We cannot live by the world standard and expect to, to have joy. See, culture says be true to yourself. It'll come up on the screen. Culture says be true to yourself, but faith says be true to Jesus. I hate Somebody says, be, oh, just be true to you. No, don't be true to you, darling. You are a sinner, miserable, at best, before Jesus. Don't be true to you. The, sin, the heart is deceitful above all things, the Bible says. And it is so true, because that's why we get offended. That's why we think things are unfair, because our heart says, you deserve. The thing we deserve is punishment in eternity. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'll take it from you so that you can have blessing of eternity with me. So that you can have blessing in the life now. We have to live by a different standard. So don't be true to yourself. Be true to Jesus. Whatever Jesus has said, follow those things. Whatever the Word of God says, do that. That will keep you on the right track. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing. Renew. Sometimes we just glaze over these verses, don't we? Don't conform to the pattern. So that means gossip is a pattern. If you're a gossiper, it's a pattern you've developed. Maybe it came long before you knew Jesus. Some people develop patterns as a Christian. Legalism is a pattern. It's a disgusting pattern. It's the opposite of living holy. Holiness isn't legalism. But in our Pentecostal circles, which we were birthed out of the holiness movement, a lot of you may not know this, but Pentecostalism in the early 1900s was holiness movement. It morphed into legalism. Because if you just do the check marks, it's a lot easier, right? Okay, all right, I didn't, I didn't commit an affair this week. That was good. I, you know, kept myself pure. That was right. Oh, uh, um, yeah, I... I I didn't, I didn't say too many bad words this week. It's always how we justify it. I didn't say too many bad words this week. Um, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I said bless you to the, to the bus driver this week. That was good. That was, he made, they put a smile on his face. And oh, God, like that one. This is how we are. We rationalize in our brain. See, we're talking about what's fair. And really, if we start going through these checklists, that, that becomes legalism. Holiness says, no, no. Hey, I noticed that you're, you're feeling that. Hey, do you want to talk? You know what? Somebody slaps your cheek, you turn the other one and say, you know what? I know you're going through some tough times. May God bless you. You know what? Um, 
Can I do something to, to help you? Oh, you know what? I, I, I'm feeling like I want to lash out in anger, but it's just me being angry. I'm going to re- refuse that. Holiness says, uh, Jesus, I, I'm doing these things for you. I, I'm going to be kind to my neighbor who has that really loud muffler on their vehicle next door and runs it for, for half an hour while I'm trying to sleep. And instead of being angry at them and thinking evil in my heart about them, I'm going to pray for them that they'll buy a new muffler. No, that, they will, that, 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 you, that I'll be able to get through to them and, and, and maybe get to know them and find out you know, what they're interested in and maybe things will change. Holiness, holiness is the most beautiful thing you can practice in your life. When you start to, to try to practice holiness, you don't care about unfairness any longer. You know that you'll have un, unfair treatment. You know that you're still going to get sick from time to time. You, you know that you're going to experience loss. You know that bad people are going to do bad things, but good people do bad things sometimes too. Because we need desperately Jesus in our life. Renew your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern. Transform it by the renewing of your mind. Make it new over and over and over. And when you've done it ten times, do it ten more. Peter said to Jesus, how many times should we forgive? Trick question, right? Seven times? Seven's a very key number in Scripture. Seven times? Jesus said, 70 times seven. In other words, I'm going to put it into, into crass, almost crass fisherman language. Peter, don't be stupid. You have to keep forgiving until you get to heaven. Because I forgave you so you could get to heaven. That you could be with me in eternity. You know, that's what we need to understand when we do these things. Constantly renew our mind. Because when we're at that place, that's when we can test and approve what God's will is in our life. You say, I don't know what God's will is. Because you aren't, you're still conforming to the pattern of the world. You're not transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you're not renewing this thing right here, which would also affect here, if you're not renewing these things, you're never going to know what God's will is for your life. Your spiritual ear is deaf. And the good news is God is ready, willing, and able to help your spiritual ear hear again. The second thing, when life seems a little unfair, prepare yourself for opposition. Prepare yourself for opposition. People are going to oppose you. Consequently, the churches aren't in lockdown around the world because I believe governments are all against the churches, particularly in Canada. They're afraid of a disease, and they're overreacting, some would say. I will leave my opinion for another time. But don't expect, oppos- don't expect to go through life and not have opposition as a believer. When you say, I, I believe that marriage is the only way for a good, healthy sexual relationship, people are going to be opposed to that. When you say that all lives matter, people are going to hate you for it. Honestly, how can you look at these little kids and not say all lives matter? Every beautiful color of the rainbow that we have, of child, and that, that you can't say that that, isn't, that that doesn't matter to the Lord? When he looks at the little sparrow and says, I know when a sparrow falls to the ground, how will I not much more know more your, the little ones? That if you would lead a little one astray, if you would lead a little one to, to disobey God, you would be better that you would be drowned in the depths of the sea with a millstone tied around your neck. In other words, God takes little kids seriously. But when you take a stand for that, the world's going to oppose you. It's unfair. They should know better, shouldn't they? How do we know that it's t- almost time for Jesus to come back? When people will look at an inmate who committed murder and say, we shouldn't deal with them harshly, but it's okay to kill a little child who's never been born yet. I'm not talking about if you have ever done that. What I'm talking about is the, the, the mindset of the world to think that life doesn't matter, but some life matters. It, it just doesn't make sense. But when you take those kind of positions, you're going to get opposition. Be prepared for it. Find, in, or sorry, uh, knowing that trouble is coming will help you be prepared when it shows up. So when, 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 when trouble shows up to you, you're prepared. You're ready. Half of life is about preparation. You know, whenever you see, you know, an athlete and they do that, they do their, whatever it is they're going to do in the Olympics. Yeah, anybody have a particular Olympic sport they like? I like the, I like the sprint, 100-meter sprint. Amazing. 
The Eurasian bolt, when he runs, just, it's just like lightning. It's amazing, right? We see seven seconds of pop, run, done. He's like, I could do that. Do you realize it took him years of practice and preparation to get his body in a position that he could run seven seconds and create world record after world record? When you see that person jump the pole and, and vault over the pole in the Olympics and, and break the record, when you see the, the hardest slap shot, when you see the, the, the farthest uh, hit in baseball, whenever you, whenever you see these different sporting uh, records fall and you see that few seconds of what they did, it was years of preparation to get there. Don't think as a believer that you're going to be able to split the waters like Moses did in, in, in serving Jesus for one year. Moses had to go away for 40. That was after he killed someone. So don't tell me that you can't be a murderer and repent of that and God can't rebirth you into something new and make you a beautiful new creation. Friends, there is always hope, as long as you have breath, that if you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you confess with your mouth that He is Lord, and you confess your sins to Him, that He will not make you new. He will, and He will birth in you a new person, a new creation, where the old passes away and the new has come. If that doesn't get you up in the morning and put a smile on your face, nothing in this life ever will. And we are so blessed that we get to know our Lord like that. Be prepared for opposition, though. See, Jesus said in, in John 15, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. That was Jesus. The world hated Jesus. What, what did Jesus do? Peace on earth, goodwill to men. That's a real, that's a real tough one to, to, to like, isn't it? Peace to everyone. No, we don't like peace to everyone. Only peace to me. Like, it just doesn't make sense to, to, when the world is so off, but that's what the enemy does. The enemy just said, did, did he really say that? Is it really that good? He just gets you to question. If you find that you're just questioning truth all the time, and you're not starting to absorb the truth, that, you know, be, be careful where your sources are coming from. But if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. They killed Jesus. All he did was heal people. All he did was raise the dead. All he did was turn the water into wine. He loved the party. He was very cautious not to be drunk, though. He was very clear on that. But, you know, Jesus did miracle after miracle after miracle. Healing lepers. The outcasts of society who were kept in camps until their bodies fell apart. You know, he goes up and he touches them. To Samaritan women who were, you know, the repugnant to the culture and just like trash to, the, to everyone around them, Jesus goes and takes conversation with them. To the tax collector, he goes to their home and he says, let me show you a better way. To those that, 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 that we would all shun in the church, he went to and he said, no, 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 let me gather you together because there is a better way. I can set you free. Prepare yourself for opposition. The third thing, find encouragement in Jesus. Find encouragement in Jesus. Be encouraged by Him. Suffering for doing right in an unfair world makes sense and gives meaning to your situation when you live for Jesus. Unless you live for Jesus, unfairness makes no sense at all. We could all just pack up right now and go home and just cry in our, in our lunch. But when you serve Jesus... Unfairness makes a lot of sense because we're in a fallen and broken world. We're in a world that is just trying to get by and, and, and they're trying to find hope, but they're not looking to the right source. We know the source of hope, don't we? Do you know the source of hope today? Yes. Who is he? Jesus. There you go. Jesus is our source of hope. And when you feel down, go back to him, run to him, talk to him. Talk out loud, walk down the street, let people think you're crazy, it's all right. Nothing greater than hearing somebody, I, I, one time, I, was, I can't remember what it was, it was a long time ago, I was just walking down the street, somewhere where, I don't even remember where it was, and I heard somebody singing a, 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 a Christian song, or like a worship song or a praise song, I can't remember, it was a church song anyways. You know, they're just under their breath, and they're, they, we, I walked by them, I heard them say it, and I was like, ah, Christian right there, all right. If they could do it on the street, so can I. So you know what? I, I, one thing I always admired about some of my older Christian friends is they, they, would, you know, they would give Jesus praise in, in the middle of everything. I remember one guy I work with, he would say, praise God, isn't that great? And you're like, whoa, that's a Christian right there. Everybody kind of looks at him with all the furrowed brow, and I'm like, with you. 
You know? It, it, it's just encouraging. When one person takes, dares to take a stance, how it makes you stand that little bit taller and makes you dare to try it yourself. Find encouragement in Jesus. There's a lot of encouraging things, friends. You know, yeah, you didn't get the promotion because you're a Christian and they, they want you to work Sundays and you want to have those Sundays off so you can serve in your church. Fine. God will bring you another promotion. He'll put you into a better job. He'll, he'll provide you funding to, to pay your bills in a different way. You know, maybe, maybe somebody doesn't want to be your friend anymore because you believe that life is sacred and, and that, we, that you stand for, for trying to get kids to, to, be, to be protected. And, you know, they, they don't want to be your friend anymore because of that. Not because you judge them, but just because you judge that, what the world is saying, that's not good, I, I, want, to, I want to change that. I want to stand for life is important. Your life is important. My life's important. Let's stand for life. And, and, and they want to turn against you. That's not fair. We had a great friendship. But because the world is so politicized, they turn on you. You know what? Take encouragement. in Jesus, knowing that Jesus had his best friends turn his back on him right when he needed them most. Peter denied himself to a little girl. Judas sold him out for, for silver. Jesus knows what you're going through, friends. Take encouragement. He's been with you. And then the fourth thing today is this. Use your struggle to inspire others. Use the struggle. I always say never let anything go to waste. Never, they, they say never let, a, a, let a, a, a good problem go to waste. Well, don't let it go to waste. Use your struggle to inspire others in the middle of the unfairness that you're facing. When somebody sees that somebody was gossiping about you because you, know, you won't do certain things because you're a Christian, and you turn the other cheek, I guarantee you, before long, it's going to inspire some other people around you who might dare to do what you're doing. Everybody is a little bit afraid from time to time. An effective way to help other people know the hope of Jesus is to lead by example. There's a room full of 50 people here today. Let's lead by example. Let's say no to ungodliness. Let's say no to sinfulness. Let's say no to fear. Let's say no to bad secular ideas that are out in the world. Let's say yes to things of, of the Lord. Let's say yes to praising His name. Let's say yes to gathering together. Let's say yes to spurring one another on to love and good works. Use your struggle to inspire others. Ephesians 4 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ. God forgave you, forgiving each other, kind and compassionate. Do those kinds of things. And that is some of the greatest examples of leadership that you are ever going to move on, on a person around you in your life. And that will probably have a greater impact than even a sermon will from, a, from the front of a church somewhere. It's not about waving your Bible at people. It's about being a living Bible each and every day of your life. Amen. It's about when you leave this building... That you're just as holy that when you sat in the seat that you occupy this morning or when you served in a ministry this morning. That when somebody swears at you, not because you did anything wrong, just because they're angry, you, you return it with a blessing. See, unfairness says you should get even with them. But God's mercy says, return the unfairness with blessing. Return the unfairness with encouragement. Return the unfairness with love that came to you through Jesus. Um, Charles Spurgeon, I'm going to finish with this quote before we go into communion. To trust God in the light is nothing but trust Him in the dark. That's faith. To trust God in the light is nothing. But trust Him in the dark, that's faith. Maybe this week you really experienced some unfairness, been mistreated, things didn't go your way, maybe you got a bad health thing. Maybe you just feel really lonely and worried. Maybe you're just isolated. And you see everybody else enjoying some time together, but you feel alone and you feel isolated. And you feel, you know, it's unfair. Where, where are my friends? Where are the people that care for me? I want you to know today, friends, life's unfair. But the Savior, he's not fair either. Because if he was, we'd all be in hell. 
But our, our Savior is gracious. He's loving. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's empowering. He's encouraging. He's positive. He's forgiving. I'll take that kind of unfairness any day of the week over what I deserve. And so friends, I want to encourage you this week, you know, when things are unfair, remember we live by a different standard. Prepare yourself for the opposition you're going to face when you take a stand. Find encouragement in Jesus even when things aren't going your way. And use the struggle to inspire others because that means your eyes are looking up and not out. When, Jesus got, or when Peter got off the boat to go walk to Jesus, as long as he locked eyes with Jesus, he walked on the water. It was only when he started looking at the waves that he began to sink. We don't need to sink. Let's walk on the water. Because the Savior's right in front of us. And all we got to do is keep our eyes fixed on him. And unfairness, those waves of unfairness that, that fly around us, we won't even see them because we're locked on the Savior who's leading us home. And that's the place where we want to be, amen? amen. Father, life's unfair and it hurts at times. It's, it's strong and it's powerful and it pulls us in so many directions. And God, I know that everyone in this room experiences, has experienced, or will experience unfairness in their life for some of the silliest reasons and some of the meanest reasons. But ours isn't to ask why, ours is to look to you. Because you're not fair either. You go above and beyond for your people because you love your kids. You love each and every son and daughter in this room here this morning. Each and son and daughter that's watching by, by camera today, online, you love them. You want to redeem them. You want to build them. You want to put your, your will in them. You want to uh, help them find purpose and hope and happiness in, in, in salvation. So today, Lord God, when we come against these unfair moments, may we keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus. May we remember these things and, and, and forget about looking at the waves of unfairness around us and look directly to you to lead us home. I pray, God, you'd encourage those that, that need encouragement this week to take their worth from the salvation that you have given them to take their hope from the purposes that you have given to their life. I pray that you'd bless them. Make them strong in Jesus' name.